What is up, everybody? Welcome to today's episode of the Indie Investor Pod. We are Indie Investors talking indie investing. And today we've got a special episode. Uh, we've got two members of the Simple Team, uh, Mr. Nigel McGill and Ronnie Reese. So uh, two of our acquisition agents at Simple Wholesaling. And uh, um, today we're going to talk about uh, picking up your first investment property. Uh, all three of us actually have like a brief story to share on how we got into buying our first property. And the funny thing is we actually, I believe we all bought it like within the same month. So <laughs> I think it was about August of this year. We all, uh, you know, coincidentally got, got into buying our first deal and uh, all three different, different types of properties, different types of situations going on. But basically today uh, we just wanted to kind of go around and kind of discuss the property in detail, kind of uh, how it looks, you know, you know, how you bought it, what it looks like now, what, it's, what your plan is for the future with the property, so on and so forth. That way, anyone listening that's looking to pick up their first property here in Indianapolis, um, you know, hopefully we can, you, get, you can get some takeaways from it. Um, you know, we'll try to, try to do our best to, to be as transparent as possible. Um, and then, uh, you know, any, any tips at the end, we'll, we'll kind of go over. So, um, you know, again, we've got Nigel. We'll start with you, man. So, um, you go ahead and just give a brief intro of, of how long you've been in real estate um, and then tell us about, uh, about your first property that you bought. Yeah, so thanks guys. Um, so I'm Nigel. I've been with the company for about four years. So been in real estate for about four years. Uh, this particular property that I got, I was actually driving for dollars. I was using deal machine. And so I found this property. I, I just noticed the grass was long. It, it didn't look super run down, but I noticed there were a couple of things maybe needed a little bit of repairs just from the outside. So I added this property and I actually skipped trace, um, got the number and called the owner. And so he, he, def he said he wanted to sell, but he was like kind of hesitant. He was like chicken tires. <laughs> and so um, every once in a while, I would just keep following up with him. And it took about, I think it was about eight months before he actually decided to sell. So uh, just kept in communication and everything like that. He, he wanted 25,000, which was like super cheap, was three bedroom, one bath. And so just without even seeing the property, I knew we could do that price just based on the area. And the outside looks pretty decent. So yeah, just kept following up with him. And then eventually we, we kept talking and we got it up to about 30,000. So I ended up paying 30,000 for this property. I never saw the inside of it, actually. Um, so I bought it sight unseen, uh, which was honestly kind of risky. But I knew, I mean, three bed, one bath for 30000 and the outside looked pretty decent. And I, he gave me a lot of information about it. He just, he didn't want to disturb the tenant. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It, it was kind of risky, but it, it paid off. So I ended up purchasing the property and then um, it was already rented out at $400 a month, which is super, super low for three bedroom. <laughs> And yeah. so actually, um, I was talking with Dion McNeely and he actually has a, uh, he does a podcast too, but he was telling me you could do what's called the binder method where you basically talk with the tenant and uh, you just ask them, what do you, what do they think a fair price is? You show them what the rents are in the area and you're like, okay, what do you think a fair price is? And so she said $700. So basically it went up from 400 to 700 and I only paid $30,000 for it. So it was uh, cash flowing pretty much from day one. Awesome, man. So <clears throat> tell us where, what area of Indianapolis is that in? Yeah, so it's in, uh, it's close to the state fairgrounds. So uh, 46205 area. Um, okay. It's a decent area. This particular area is a little up and coming. <laughs> yeah, I would say, I would say so. Um, I think I remember when I was first looking at that deal, I was like, Man, he's picking this property up. It's four hundred a month. I'm like, what's he doing? And then cherry on top was when you're like, I haven't even seen it yet, but I'm just gonna go ahead and buy it. So, I know. Uh, <laughs> so I think people listening are probably like, what in the world is is he doing? So what? I guess um, I have a couple questions. First question would be like, what? What was it? Just your desire, your urge to just to get in, or like, what was your thinking behind that? Of, of not of not looking at it and saying, hey, I'm just, I'll just buy it. It could have been, dude, it could right. have been like, it could have been way torn up inside. For sure. And it, it was definitely a little bit risky. And I got pretty nervous at, at one point. I was like, I don't know if I should go through with this because I haven't even seen the inside. Do I really want my first deal to be a side unseen? But I just think at that price and the amount of square footage, it had a two car detached garage. The landscaping actually looked pretty decent. It wasn't like 
super run down or anything like that. Um, so I just figured, you know, three bed, one bath. Um, I feel like it's a pretty, pretty safe risk in my opinion. And so that's, that's why I just went forward with it. Yeah. And I think a lot of that probably, um, you know, so you're like, we mentioned before, you're an acquisition, you're on the acquisition team here uh, for our company. So you've seen a lot of the houses in that area, right? So, you know, where the prices are. So it kind of just knowing the the local market for you, just being here in Indianapolis probably was advantageous for you because you said, okay, well, it's 30 grand. Like I know what, I know what all the houses around this property are because I've been in them. I've been in most of them. And you know what the rents are, so that probably, I mean, that probably gave you a little bit more confidence on actually closing, closing through the deal, I bet. For sure. I, I don't think if, if I didn't have any experience, I would not have bought this property just because. Or, or if you would have been like out, out, out of state. <laughs> right, exactly. So if I, if I didn't have like any idea of what the neighborhood was like, I probably wouldn't have done it. But I felt, I felt confident just because I have seen so many houses in that area. So, it, yeah. 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 That's awesome, man. And then uh, tell us real quick, how did you, um, did you, how did you fund the deal? Did you use just your, your savings? Did you use a loan? What did you do? Yeah. So it's kind of a crazy story, but the previous year I had purchased my first property, my primary residence I'm living in now. Um, and so at the beginning of COVID um, before prices had raised, <clears throat> excuse me, was, uh, that's, that's when I made the offer on this property. So I got it really low, then prices shot up and, uh, I actually was connected with a, um, a local bank and I got kind of close with one of the guys there. And he honestly, just a good connection to have there. And he, uh, basically helped me get a home equity line of credit on the property because from when I purchased it to about eight months later, it was, it went up like $75,000 in value. Um, and so I got a home equity line of credit for $43,000. And so I purchased this property in cash for 30,000. After closing costs, it was like 31,000. Um, and then I just got a delayed financing on it. So I basically got to pull out almost all my money from that. And so looking to purchase another one. Awesome, man. And then uh, last question for this property. Uh, what's, what are your plans? How long you plan on holding on to it? Um, is it going to be a short-term thing or a long-term thing for you? Yeah, so I, I definitely want to hold on to this long-term. The tenant who's there already, she's actually been there for about 22 years. So that was kind of another reason why I felt com like comfortable purchasing it is because she's been there forever. I know she's probably going to want to stay. And so it didn't feel like I was going to have, you know, turnover. I could just keep the same tenant. And so, yeah, I definitely want to keep this long-term. Um as time goes on, I'll, I'll do some renovations and she's okay with that. We've already talked about it. And so I'll be doing some updates here and there. And I think that also helps justify the price increase on the rent. And again, she picked the price. So it wasn't like I came in here and yeah. told her like it's, it's raising $300. Um, and yeah. so, and she's like, yeah, and I understand if it, if it raises again down the road after you need repairs. And she, she said that to me, I didn't even mention that. So she's been pretty understanding. It's been pretty smooth. So I want to just keep it as long as I can. Okay. Awesome, man. Well, uh, yeah, it sounds like you. Uh, that's pretty good for your first deal on how you created it, and uh, you know, got the got the tenant paying you know market rent, and um, so good job on that, man. So, uh, Ronnie, let's uh, shift over to you because I know it's different. It's your your deal is different different type of deal, different area. So, um, why don't you give us kind of the quick background, and we'll kind of run through you know the same same questions that Nigel went through. Well, hi, I'm, um, you guys uh, don't know me. My name is Ronnie. I have also been with the company for about four years um, and um, just love working and networking with other wholesalers. Um, and so for me, um, you know, one of the things is I always encourage people to kind of get in where you fit in, you know, um, because maybe you can't get the 60, 70, 100, you know, $20,000 cookie cutters and th things like that. Um, you know, and sometimes maybe you're looking at different markets that are maybe a little bit outside of Indianapolis. And so for me, you know, Nigel got a great deal to be able to find a three, you know, three bedroom, one bath, you know, in Indianapolis for $30,000 uh, pretty much. But for me, um, you know, I was, you know, been working with another wholesaler um, and they work in a different market up in Muncie. And so they shot this deal over. Um, and I took a good look at it and I was like, Hey, I used to live in Muncie, you know what I'm saying? For almost, you know, 14 years. So I was kind of familiar with the area, um, and what was going on with the property property looked pretty good from the pictures. Um, and I think it was around about the same price point about, you know, twenty nine, thirty thousand $30,000. And I said, well, 
let me go up and go take a look. And uh, the wholesaler told me like, hey, look, the seller's really weird. Um, you know, didn't really want any inspections and stuff. Um, and so then I was like, I said, well, I'm still going up there. I got to at least lay my eyes on what I'm potentially buying. So um, I went up there. The seller was very weird. He said, I just thought you was coming here to check the furnace. I said, well, <laughs> why are you walking to the rest of the house? I'm just like, well, look, I'm, the, I'm a funding partner, you know what I'm saying, uh, with, with the wholesaler. So I'm just here to just kind of check the property, see what else is going on. I mean, he was super weird. Um, but cosmetically, everything looked okay um, with the property. Um, I knew that it probably needed a new roof. Uh, but, you know, I had that checked right after closing, um, you know, and the, the thought was, hey, you know, things should be okay. You should be able to get through, you know, the winter time, And then, you know, but soon after, as soon as it get warm, it's going to replace it. And that, you know, was the plan. Um, so, you know, for me, and then my whole thing was, you know, I wanted to buy, you know, as close to turnkey as possible, um, just so that I can go the section eight route. That's what I wanted to do. Um, I liked the security of being able to just know it doesn't matter who's the president, whether it's Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Donald Trump Jr., Barron Trump, or Mickey Mouse. It does not matter. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, uh, that check gonna come. And then, you know, with the tenant, you know, hopefully, you know, just in the screening process and screening with them, you know, checking them out, you know, what's kind of going on. I mean, that allowed me to still be able to, you know, just kind of have that automatic cash flow and kind of count on that. Um, and then also, too, a lot of people, are, they, stay, they stay away from Section 8 because they say, hey, well, you know, it takes too long to turn around. You know, the inspections are also weird and stuff like that. But again, I think Section 8 in some of those smaller markets um, actually makes a little more sense because the turnaround time to be able to get to those people, you know, what I'm saying, is shorter because they're not in this big metropolitan area, you know, um, so that also was, was, was a key factor in it too. And it also turned out to be true. You know, um, it took two inspections. One was just like, you know, something really small, but uh, you know, we were able to kind of get in, you know, under, you know, $600, you know, uh, to be able to go ahead and get it ready um, for it to pass inspection. So that was good. Um, but I'm going to tell you, you know, my word of advice already is, um, you know, I've had some things kind of change and turn that roof that you know we thought would last you know through the winter guess what folks it's not and so there are some some issues and things like that that are related to the roof that are happening and so now you know we're trying to figure out okay well what is the best way to move forward you know yes you bought a you know you bought a great property or what you thought was a great property at a great price for a big yard Yes, it's cash flowing at you know four 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 twenty five a month you know um, that's awesome it's automatic but now we have a big repair, you know, um, and some sub subsequent repairs that we need to figure out. And if this tenant can still stay there and if we need to try to move the tenant and, you know, what does Section 8 look like? And then after talking with the caseworker, there's a huge need for Section 8, you know, um, and they don't really have enough Section 8 um, availabilities in that market. So, you know, I was like, I said, oh, well, that, that, that's good to know. There's a need there. But, you know, you want, always want to make sure that you're buying right, get that inspection. Um, and, you know, just know what your action items are. And it's probably best to go ahead and take care of those action items. Um, as opposed to waiting, because if you wait, then that might kind of put you in the crisis, um, you know, and that's kind of where I'm at. Not that things are all bad or all lost, uh, but just, you know, we're trying to actively problem solve with the tenant and the caseworker through all of these things. But had I taken care of it when I first bought it, wouldn't be going through these things right now, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. uh, definitely some learning lessons um, in that. Awesome. So, yeah, um, well, I love how, uh, you know, your first one was in Muncie because I don't, I don't know if that was always your plan, but I think it kind of just naturally happened. It's kind of like what you said, you're just familiar with the area. Like I'm not. So like, I, I, I never looked there. And for, for a little bit before I bought mine, you had me kind of looking at Muncie because I was looking at your numbers and I was like, wow, completely done house for like under $30,000. I'm, I'm like, what? Uh, so I, I had, I had thought about it. So, um, still on the table you, who knows i could pick up one there um yeah. so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna jump in here real quick for people that might be watching yeah. when you're looking at some of these smaller markets and stuff one of the things that you have to think about and you have to kind of be okay with is that cash flow has to be king in some of these smaller markets you're not going to get the appreciation you know that you would necessarily necessarily do in a bigger metropolitan area you know nigel talked about hey in eight months you know his property value went up $75,000, he was able to pull out a, you know, HELOC and do that. 
that's not normally going to happen in some of these smaller markets. And so you have to be okay with buying right on the front end, conservative enough. So should a crisis happen with a roof or, you know, growth or mold or foundation, whatever it is, that you're okay with that and that you're just allowing cash flow to be what drives your decision as opposed to also trying to get the appreciation. So that's what makes those uh, smaller markets uh, kind of work. And you have to be okay with that when you're thinking about buying in a Muncie or Anderson or a lapel or something like that. Yeah. Awesome, man. And then uh, with that property in particular there, um, you know, what, what is the, what's the future hold for that one for you? <laughs> We're actively talking about that now, um, you know, and just kind of, kind of looking at it. I've had, I do have a thought of probably, probably maybe just replacing the roof, um, you know, giving the tenant, you know, some, uh, you know, 60 days to be able to vacate, um, you know, and ending that contract with her. I've already talked about casework. Her casework is okay with that. But the issue is, again, she doesn't know where to go. So this property, um, because I bought it at the price point that I did, ARV for this property, again, it's a 2-1 with a detached garage, huge yard. Um, in the back and already fenced in. I think ARV for the property is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 65 or so, you know, buying it at 30. So I still bought it at a good price. I can still probably put in, you know, with a roof and some cosmetics, maybe, you know, eight to 15, depending on how big I want to go it. And I can flip it, you know, if, if I absolutely need to, or I can double down and buy, you know, double down on it and kind of make repairs if need to. So, you know, that is actually still, you know, we're still discussing it as we speak, uh, just because we want to do what's best for everyone. Um, so, you know, I don't know, you know, be a good update, you know, here in a couple of weeks to see exactly what we did with it. Yeah, I think for both you, um, both Nigel's property and your property, I think just because you did buy it at such a low price point, um, you know, you could, I mean, just depending on what, like how your lease looks um, down the road, you could just go ahead and, you know, do a quick flip on one of those properties. So, um, and then and then profit out. So it just really depends on what your long term goals are, right? So uh, one thing I forgot to ask both of you, um, so I, my understanding is that you're both managing your own, right? Mm. What is yes. what what were what was your decision on that, and is it going to be your decision long term? So I'll have Nigel go first. Yeah. So I think for me, I'm just going to manage it myself right now. I just have one property, and it's it's only like five minutes from my house. So it's not a huge hassle. I mean, she just had a, a pipe that needed repaired. And so I just fixed that the other day. Well, I, I called someone to fix it. But um, yeah, I'm just managing myself. I think eventually, you know, as my portfolio grows, which is the goal, um, I think once I get to a certain point, I'll probably have like hire a company to manage it myself. But right now it's, it's manageable for, for me. Um, for me, um, you know, we went the uh, self-managing route, number one, to kind of just save some costs, um, but then also to um, my wife, um, you know, you know, talking with her and just giving her personality profile. She's a rules and regulations, black and white, the law with the law type person, um, you know, and she is a stay at home mother, which is a full time job. Um, but, you know, just to give her something else to do. And she likes learning new things and learning new skills and applying new skills. Um, I said, hey, you know, let's what do you think about this, you know, and, and trying this and her having a background in case management and, and, and being a adult probation officer and stuff. So, you know, her working with other case workers and working with, you know, our tenants and stuff and all the inspections and things like that. She's actually very good at that. And so um, we decided to kind of do that. And one of the funny things is, is that our tenant, um, which um, we kind of led with our heart as opposed to what, you know, looking at what her credit score was and what her income was. And that was more so just because, you know, she's a sex and agent, so we can kind of maybe take that risk a little bit. Um, she actually, you know, said, hey, how about you guys use this app to help with property management so I can pay? And so like every month she's hassling me about, hey, did you set up the account so that I can pay the rent, you know, pay my portion of the rent? So it was just really good to kind of get that feedback from a tenant. You know, you have a good tenant when they're hassling you about trying to pay you money, um, you know, and, make, and they're also also providing solutions, you know, to help with your property management and stuff. Um, and it also helps too to have the wonderful Alicia Drake, who if you're watching this and you're looking at buying property that you connect with, uh, she has been a valuable resource um, to help us, um, you know, help us all kind of figure out, hey, what to do, how to problem solve, who to contact in Muncie and Anderson or whatever it is like that. So all of that has been really good to help with the self-management. So I think we're going to continue to self-manage until it just gets too much, but, you know, hopefully that is good. I want to be cash on it, you know, $20,000 a month. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure, man. So awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So I'll be pretty brief with mine. I'll kind of point out some differences. So 
Um, I, I also bought a single family home um, in August of this year. It's actually a home that I got off a wholesaler and that wholesaler was Ronnie Reese. So uh, <laughs> it was a deal that Ronnie got, uh, came, actually came through our pipeline. I saw the photos. Um, it's actually, it's, in, it's near Washington Park. Um, I know uh, there's some mixed feelings about that area, um, but again, for me, um, just being here and seeing the properties around this specific block, um, you know, near the park, I was like, hey, I feel good about this. The numbers worked. Um, it's a three bedroom, one bath, and it was currently, or it is currently rented for $9.50 a month. So they picked up a property that already had a lease in place till February of 22. So for me, that was very important because as my first property, I wanted something as easy as possible. Mm-hmm. And for me, because because I'm in the cash flow game, that's 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 my long term goal. Um, I don't want to get into flipping houses. Will I do it? Sure, maybe because it might just fall on my lap as I continue my journey. But when I'm looking at properties for myself to pick up right now, I'm looking at it for long term purposes. So saw this one. Like I said, it was meant, it was rented already for nine fifty a month, which is high for the area. I think market rent should be like eight fifty. So I said, hey, I could roll, roll with this um, and do a couple of things. I could try to keep that tenant in there um, come February, or I can, when they, when they move out, um, do a little touch up work to the property. And I know it's kind of contradicting what my goals are. I'm like, I could just go ahead and sell this. Like I could, I could put some work in it and sell it. Only reason why I consider that is because um, it would allow me to put money into a property in a different area, which was more on my sites. I wasn't ne- necessarily looking at Washington Park as an area to start investing. I was like, in my head, like my, my picture perfect property, I was like, I'm gonna buy my first rental in Christian Park. That's where I was looking. And, but everything flies off the shelf, right? And it's for my first deal, I wanted to do a little bit more due diligence and I just couldn't compete with anybody. Um, and uh, so I, I saw this one, like I said, it just kind of fell on my lap. I said, why not? I've been thinking about doing this for a long time. So I just jumped right in. Um, I, my due diligence was Ronnie. So, <laughs> you know, he's on my team. I trust him. I say, hey, Ronnie, get me the lease. Let me see the photos. What do you think about the property? Give me your opinion. The, the seller we got it from had uh, recently did a, a light renovation on it. So uh, plumbing, electrical was updated, updated uh, mechanicals. The roof was in good condition. She put in new flooring. Uh, she painted the place, had new windows. So I was like, dude, that's like, let's do this. So I literally like my due diligence was, hey, Ronnie, how's it look? What do you think? All right, I'm going to buy it. And I think I bought it like two weeks later. Yeah. Um, so uh, so that's, that was, that's kind of like the background of the property itself, um, kind of how I sourced it. Um, I am using a property manager. So I elected to do property management for a couple of reasons. Um, one is because I was going to do it anyway. So I wanted to build a relationship with someone from the get-go. Um, so, um, I mean, I'll do a little plug here. I'm using Polario Property Management. Um, it's uh, Dustin Rules Company and Connor Bland kind of uh, heads that up. So if you haven't uh, heard of them, feel free to reach out to them. If you're looking for a property manager, they do a great job. Um, so I'm using them for that. And then also, since there was already a tenant in place, um, just some things I learned um, throughout my years of just working with other buyers and investors, like I didn't necessarily want to get in with the owner too close, like stop by, have them see me, meet me only because I don't, if I'm going to use a property manager, I don't want them to see me as the person to contact for anything. I wanted to stay behind the scenes as much as possible. So um, even though it's, it sounds silly to most people to, you know, to kind of use a, a manager for one property because it's like, hey, you're, you're wasting all that money. But for me, it wasn't. Point number, I think three is because I'm glad I'm using a manager because my first month of having this property, one thing I didn't, well, wasn't aware of was that this current tenant was in the middle of applying for like rental assistance. So she was in a position where she all, she all of a sudden couldn't pay rent. And I'm like, uh oh, like here we go, like my first property. And now I'm getting, now I'm starting to get into a sticky situation. So, but I was okay with it because I said, hey, I, I have to go through stuff like this now to grow, learn. I don't care what happens because I'm going to learn something from it and it's going to help me out in the future. So I was, we actually, uh, me and my property manager were, were preparing to do an eviction and um, which would have been next week. 
well, a couple of weeks ago, they, she finally contacted us and said, hey, like my rental assistance got approved. I can pay rent now. So she had paid, um, you know, the rent that she was behind along with some late fees. She paid it all. Um, and then now we're hoping that, you know, we'll, we'll, we're expecting rent from uh, the first of the month from here on out until her lease is up. So in that situation, I would have been probably in a more of a panic mode if I was just me handling that. Yeah, we've done that as a company before, but it's it, it definitely felt different when it was your tenant and your property. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was really grateful that I had this make, made the decision to have a property manager to go ahead and take care of that for me. Um, so my plan is moving forward with the with that house. Uh, I plan on keeping it long term. That that's like I said, that's the plan for me. Um, we'll see what things look like come February. Um, you know, if that tenant wants to stay. Or if they if they want to want to go ahead and leave, I'll like I said, I'll do um, you know another light renovation to it and see where the market is at that time. Because right now, um, I could probably just sell the house and just you know, make a small profit and then take my take my money I have into it and and you know like I said, put it somewhere else. But I want to keep it. Um, I did finance the deal with uh, some private financing. I put some money down and uh, had a private private uh, investor on the back end. So. I'm going to eventually refi that out. Uh, so right now it's cash flowing like a little under 200 bucks a month um, after all fees, taxes, insurance are taken out. So after I refi, that should be uh, you know closer like the 270 mark, which is like right. I wanted the I wanted the cash flow at least 200 200 dollars a month on on my my uh, personal properties. So it'll get me there to that point. Um, and then moving forward, uh, you know I'll, I'll I'll definitely look to pick up. I'm going to say it here. I'm, I want to pick up one more single family by the end of the year. Um, and then my, my eventual long-term goal is to, uh, you know, I, I, I do want to get into like the small commercial multifamily. Um, so, you know, I'll always, I'll always have single family on my mind, but, but the big goal, like on the vision board and everything is, is like, dude, you want an apartment building, right? <laughs> um, at least that's, that's my vision. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, that, that was my story on my first one. Um, kind of wrapping up here towards the end, um, kind of go around here. Just kind of last last piece of advice for anyone kind of looking to get in um, to the Indianapolis market in particular. Um, like, what would you, what would you tell yourself, Nigel, <laughs> if you're, if, if you met another Nigel, like, hey, man, I want to get into real estate. Like, you know, what what should I do? Yeah, honestly, I would just say do your due diligence, um, make connections with people in the area who are familiar with the area if, if you're not from here. Um, but yeah, just make connections, talk to people, um, get your inspection done, make sure things are good. And uh, yeah, I would say just, just go for it. And uh, for me, I would say um, identify your buy box, identify what it is and stick to that. You know, um, I, the more and more I've had conversations with people about Section 8 in smaller markets is like, you know what, man, that really makes sense. Um, you know, yeah. um, and that kind of helps with the security aspect of it and the cash flow. Um, you know, and then the other thing is being a new investor, having, you know, having the rules and, and the expectation of Section 8, you know what I'm saying? That kind of helps you also kind of learn what they're looking for and then what to kind of put in your, put in your properties as you continue to kind of, you know, branch out. So I would say just know your strategy, know what it is you're looking for, stay in your buy box, you know, on your first couple of properties, you know, as you continue to kind of grow and learn and, uh, you know, buy low <laughs> so you can resell higher later um and also kind of helps with how you need to maybe exit the strategy exit the property should something come up yeah yeah mine would just be uh i would always just keep networking for the just the financing part because there's so many different ways because i think that's a big hurdle for people getting started um at least it was for me um was you know getting the right type of financing i didn't want to throw all my cash i had towards towards you know my first one right so just making some good connections um and then making a plan with some financing partners um from there i think it's more comfortable moving forward when you don't have to shell out you know you know all the money you've set aside to to go towards one property so you can kind of focus on you know looking at the number two number three after after you buy that first one so um that would be my advice there so Guys, I really appreciate you hopping on today. Uh, it was great to hear your stories. And, um, you know, I look forward to, we, 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 we work closely together. So I look forward to seeing all of your portfolios continue to increase, um, hear the stories and see the success stories as well. So with that, we'll wrap up today's episode. This was uh, the episode of the Indie Investor Pod. All right, take care.